Good morning, everybody. My name is Karen Tucker. I'm CEO at the Churchill Club. Welcome, and thank you very much for coming out to attend this program this morning. The San Francisco Bay Area's economic vitality and ascendance as a global center of innovation owes much to institutions of higher education. Uh, for example, even beyond academic excellence, Berkeley and Stanford hold the top two slots in the nation in terms of number of alumni who go on to found venture-backed companies. So today, in a rare joint appearance, <laughs> we have UC Berkeley Chancellor Nick Dirks and Stanford University President John Hennessy to lend their perspectives on the future of higher education and what's at stake. And here to guide them in conversation, we have Quentin Hardy, Deputy Technology Editor at the New York Times. Before we start, some thanks are in order, in particular to Accenture, without whose underwriting this program would not have been possible. And I would also like to thank Dan Mogolov of UC Berkeley and Lisa Lappin of Stanford for their program partnership. Thank you. A few words about Churchill Club for our new guests. We are a preeminent technology and business forum, privileged to convene people with new ideas since 1985. And we uh, take very seriously our mission to encourage innovation, economic growth, and societal benefit. We encourage thought leadership, future focus, and always a pitch-free zone. We have three compelling programs for you between now and the end of the calendar year. They're listed in your bulletins. We hope that we will see you again after this morning. Uh, and then kicking off 2016, we'll be back at the Computer History Museum on the 21st of January with Brad Katsuyama, who is the founder and CEO of IEX, and also the subject of Michael Lewis's best-selling book, Flash Boys. They'll be here on this stage together, Michael Lewis and Brad Katsuyama, so that should be a very special program. And then on March 1st, we offer the pilot for an innovative new series called The Power of Celebrity for Good. In this series, we seek to inspire more broadly evolved social attitudes and actions that can equip us as socially responsible citizens, activists, and mentors. And the very first program in that series will, is in collaboration with Santa Clara University and Tribal Planet, and it will be Leadership Lessons from the Godfather, featuring Oscar-nominated actor James Kahn. If you are tweeting, please use, use the hashtag Churchill Club, and you will find other Twitter pointers in your programs. And uh, let's now let the party begin. We'll welcome Nick Dirks, John Hennessy, and Quentin Hardy. Hi, John. It's good to see you. Thank you so much, Karen, and thank you. I think I'll, okay. No? Is that, uh, or you want to go in the middle, Quentin? No, I'm good. <laughs> this is fine. As you can tell, this isn't canned. <laughs> So the topic this morning, and thank you all for coming at this early hour, the, the topic this morning is the future of higher ed, what's at stake? And I'm going to venture that the answer is everything. But we need to drill into that a little bit more specifically. And I think the best way to begin is for you, in turn, to talk briefly about what you do now, but almost as important what you've been through to get here and what, how that informs how you see the world ahead. So Nick, why don't you start? You mean the institution? The institution and your, your experience at it. And my experience. Both. Well, I came here now close to three years ago uh, from an Ivy League school in New York uh, because Berkeley, quite frankly, has always been, for an academic, a point of destination. It has been so, uh, so superb in so many fields, top-ranked departments, schools, programs, uh, and in fact for many, many years uh, the only other university that gave it a run for its money was Harvard. Uh, and even at Columbia we would look at the rankings and say 
you know, how could we get, you know, this program, that program, indeed a whole slew of programs to, uh, to approach the levels of consistent uh, high quality uh, uh, as, as this university. Of course, uh, we had our, our, our share of troubles in, uh, in a private university in New York in, uh, in 2008, 2009. Uh, but in reading about what was going on uh, across the University of California, across uh, many public universities, but also at Berkeley in, in particular, I was concerned when I first came here, what would the university be like? Was it really true that telephones had been cut out of every office? Uh, and, uh, you know, furloughs had been taken on a semi-permanent basis for faculty and staff and uh, graduate student stipends were going to be uh, uh, fixed and reduced and, and so on. Would the great University of California, Berkeley, uh, really emerge out of this uh, in any way comparable to how it has been for decades, really for decades? It's been one of the leading universities uh, by every measure since at least the 1930s and after the war and the post-war period. It was, it was the place uh, to come, irrespective of, of whether you were thinking about public or private universities. What, I, what I've discovered, of course, is that Berkeley did emerge uh, as strong as ever. It continues to be ranked uh, among the very best universities in the world. It's um, one ranking that I think is, is, is very important for this morning's conversation is the reputational ranking that comes out of the Times Higher, Educa Higher, Higher Educational Supplement, where six universities emerge as the top global universities. And interestingly enough, they're all paired. So you have Cambridge and Oxford, mm -hmm. Harvard, MIT, and Stanford, Berkeley. Uh, and that reflects, I think, two things. One is that these are all universities that continue to be seen uh, as, as really the gold standard. But two, that universities benefit by having this week's big game notwithstanding. <laughs> by having a really powerful university close by. And those two universities often generate much more in the way of uh, impact uh, and, uh, and, 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 and a whole variety of, uh, of ways of engaging a region than a single university can. And they actually support and help, and through a little bit of healthy competition, mm -hmm. uh, go at each other to be even better than they might otherwise be. And of course, they're sharing people all the time, uh, including uh, divided families. But the the point of the, of really to respond to the question is that Berkeley continues to be incredibly strong. Uh, it has particular strengths that, uh, that no private university has, partly because of the scale that it uh, operates at and because that scale is, is, is married to a deep commitment to access and affordability. And so the range of students who come to Berkeley almost because it is a public university, but also because of you know, the kind of uh, interests of the, of the institution, reflect uh, such a broad uh, spectrum and at such scale of, uh, of, of a population that, that spans the full, uh, you know, the full range between very low income uh, to, uh, uh, to the top, you get uh, a really meaningful, a really important uh, place where in some sense, what the New York Times called the social mobility engine of California can continue to thrive. But there are challenges, and we'll get back to that. I think you identify something very interesting right from the start, which is you came to it where there were questions of identity and survival, and yet it is at the center of a kind of um, growth, uh, development in the world, in, in technology primarily, that has, is absolutely steering the world economy. So it's both indispensable and, you know, it had this initial sense of crisis, which, you know, fortunately, you, you no longer feel is the case. Uh, John, your own experience is somewhat different because you were teaching at Stanford and then in the private sector and then came back. So talk a little bit about how that affects how you've seen Stanford and what you think is ahead for Stanford. So certainly, as you pointed out, Quentin, most of my time was spent um, being a faculty member at Stanford, uh, running research and teaching and doing what faculty uh, usually do. I did have an experience in the private sector starting a company, which was a unique experience, I think, and gave me a uh, real perspective on how to deal with some issues in, in context. Not that universities are companies. They are not. Um, if, if you just look at how we operate, uh, we charge tuition, which is less than the cost of offering education. And then, by the way, if you can't afford it, we give you a discount called financial aid. It's an unusual model that universities have, but that's, 
that partly is the important role they play in our society. You know, I'd say the biggest changes I've seen o over time, well, clearly the emergence of technology as absolutely crucial. You almost can't be a world-class university anymore without strength in engineering and technology. You simply can't do it. And that's a real, that's a real change, I think, in terms of the impact that technology uh, and, and science have on our society. Um, but if I, look at the, if I look at what's happened over time, the student body has changed the fastest and, and the most over time. We're now getting more than twice as many applications as when I started with presidents. We have the highest selectivity rate in the country, which means, unfortunately, that we are turning down lots of highly qualified students. Um, we, are, we continue to get the best and the brightest students from around the world, small numbers as undergraduates, larger numbers as uh, graduate students, and I think that's been vitally important to the health of the, of the Valley and our ability to uh, continue to lead by bringing in talent a uh, crucial thing. And this is where people want to come. They want to come to California. They want to come because this is very much a multicultural environment that supports them both the students initially, but then when they go into their professional lives. So I think that's been crucial to our ability to maintain, uh, maintain leadership. I think we'll continue to see it evolve. I think as Nick alluded to, um, this vision that universities will provide the ladder of mobility for people to go forward is absolutely crucial. And I think we are, we continue to play that role, hampered, I must say, somewhat by the quality of K-12 systems we have in our, in our country. And if there is a discrimination in our country, go look at the quality of K-12 systems in underprivileged communities versus privileged communities. That's really not uh, equity by any stretch of the imagination. So there are issues we have to work on as institutions um, and try to ensure that our students survive and, and, and do well and flourish and can go on to do great things. I think you say something quite interesting there about the, the primacy of technology in society and in education now and for the identity of a university. It has become an enormous driver, not simply because of for its material success, but the habits of technology are changing the way people learn, what they think about for careers, um, how certain social sciences even organize themselves mm -hmm. have taken on sort of technology aspects. When you think about how to deploy resources in the university, however, do you feel that tech may at times dominate too much or that conversely or similarly um, postgraduate and research work gets a lot of attention, whereas the initial role of the university might have been to provide a successful undergraduate education, dare I use the word development of character, you know, as, as part of the role of these things. Is that disappearing in the university's role simply so we can feed this tech beast? Well, in, in the case of Berkeley, uh, where its engineering and technology work has been uh, really foundational, uh, along with Stanford, uh, you, uh, you certainly want to begin by acknowledging the extent to which uh, this university has been part of the explosion in technology, of course, that has been centered so uh, clearly on this, on this region in Northern California. Uh, Berkeley was known, of course, for fundamental research uh, primarily, and I think for a long time uh, didn't really uh, get seen clearly enough for the contributions it was making to uh, the world of technology. The self-driving car, for example, first funded by DARPA, but, uh, but designed by, by Berkeley engineers, uh, was driven uh, on the Richmond Bay campus where we hope now to build a, a Berkeley global campus. Uh, Google had this, uh, this map, uh, mapping capacity that was required to actually put it uh, on a road outside the, uh, the cloisters of Richmond Bay, but, uh, but that's where it started. And you know, the semiconductor obviously came out of uh, both Berkeley and, and Stanford uh, uh, science, uh, scientific research. Uh, there's a table over here bought by Cloudera, and I salute you, uh, Berkeley grads, uh, and so many other areas that, uh, that are part of, uh, of, of the rapid change in, in, in the, in the, in, in the increased profile that technology plays in our world. But yes, indeed, the question is, uh, can it overtake a university? Uh, and what does it mean for undergraduates? Does it, does it steer things, and, ultimately? And I think what's, uh, what's important now, because technology is so ingrained in the world that we live in, as you said, uh, that we need to ensure that all of our students, and at 
Berkeley, we have 27,000 undergraduates. But all of our students have some real sense of what it means not just to live in a world with apps, but uh, to live in a world with big data, to understand the importance of data analytics, to have a sense of what it means to really uh, uh, both create but also interpret uh, the uh, extraordinary uh, uh, range of, 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 of things that affect your lives no matter whether you're in the arts or whether you're in social science or whether you're in engineering and science. And so what we're piloting this fall at Berkeley is a new course, a data science uh, analytics course, which is a pilot, uh, and a pilot which already has a, a set of connector courses that will connect students to public health, to questions of, around race and, and, and equity, but also, of course, to traditional questions in, in computer science. But build from that the possibility of having all of our students take a kind of core course uh, in data science as they progress through their undergraduate degree. Now, the hope there is not that they all go straight into the tech sector as such, but that they all have a sense of the importance uh, and have the skills uh, to interact with in a meaningful way uh, the new world we live in. Now, I see this very much as part of a new core curriculum that is aligned fundamentally with the kinds of things that uh, at Columbia we used to do in courses like contemporary civilization. You're training students to live in the world by drawing on uh, a range of things that are out there and that are going to be uh, increasingly important. It shouldn't be the only thing. It has to be joined with other things that continue to think about what it means to educate uh, a student body in being civic-minded and understanding the importance of living in a democratic society, of understanding how their voice needs to be heard and developed uh, and, and mobilized around the role they'll play as leaders, uh, both uh, here locally and indeed uh, more and more globally. Uh, and, by, uh, and in terms of the university as a whole, I think what we've been doing, I'm sure what, uh, what, what you've been doing at Stanford, is to connect uh, the work that's being done in certain uh, silos much more extensively across the system of the university as a whole. And we now have, for example, you know, all kinds of projects that bring uh, people working uh, in very technical areas uh, in contact with, uh, with economists doing work on global inequality, with uh, uh, with uh, uh, engineers who are designing uh, new kinds of technologies that can be used in India or Africa to bring diagnostic uh, biomedical uh, uh, techniques to, uh, to the world at large, and so on and so forth. So I, I'd say, historically, you have to look at something quite different that happened on the West Coast and happened on the East Coast. Stanford and Berkeley were both founded as American research universities having both an undergraduate mission and a research mission. They were not founded based on the Ivy League model of an undergraduate, often a, a seminary-like institution mm -hmm. designed to train young gentlemen um, for the law or for uh, service in, in preaching. Um, they were designed in quite a different way. And, and I think that's reflected in a number of things. Neither of us has a college that separates the undergraduates completely from the graduate students. Undergraduates get involved in research the same way graduate students get involved in, in research. And we have a dedication to both those missions. And I think, as Nick said, what I remind the, the freshmen with every year as they arrive on campus, I tell them, your undergraduate education is not about your first job. It's about something much bigger. It's about a foundation for your entire life. And studying the humanistic disciplines, studying the social sciences, which talk about how we live as a productive, cooperative society, understanding different cultures, having exposure to the arts that helps build creativity, dealing with issues of ambiguity and hard topics are vitally important. If you seek to train leaders, and I don't care whether those leaders are going into government, they're going to nonprofit, they're going to the academy, or they're going to the corporate world. They need that kind of broad background. They need to be able to work in the society we live in now, which is very different than the society that led the country 50 years ago. And I think that's a crucial thing that our universities do. They are, in some sense, the great mixing pot where students come together, learn how to work with students with very different backgrounds, learn respect, learn understanding. And that, I think, will be crucial for our success as a country. I think you've said something very profound, actually, about the American frontier, immigrant, pioneer, whatever you want to put it, experience, where the, 
there may be a balance, but there is also a stress. And the stress here is engagement with the new practical skills and technological development over uh, an emphasis on um, perhaps more legacy, <laughs> if you will, skills. And I speak as an English major, <laughs> you know, for whom I hear this and I think, oh, data science, well, game over for me. <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> no, no, no. No, I, I, I told both my kids the only thing I know about the future is you, you'll have to study a lot of stats. Yeah. It's you the know. new textual analysis, very really big is. now yeah, in, no, right. in literature research. That's Don't right. get me started. <laughs> 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 we'll take this in a whole I wrong mean, I, direction. I, 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 for, I will be the first to say that uh, there are limits to what computers can do. And if you hear a piece of computer music, if you see a piece of art created by a computer, if you see a novel written by a computer, you'll see that computers still have a long way to go to uh, match, Ameri to match I, the ingenuity of the I, human brain. And I, I teach a course brain. at the information school yeah. and I, at Cal. And I, uh, I used to say, you can't encode taste. You can't. And now I say yet. Yeah, because <laughs> you know, they get a little better. I agree with yet. I agree with yet. <laughs> you, know, you know, I'm just hedging that one now. Yeah. Um, but it is very true that the type of education that was pioneered here in the 19th century and came into its own in the 20th century, which is technology-led and um, you know based on scientific method, sort of the the best theory possible at the time and very research oriented has come to transform the world really like you know rarely seen in human civilization in a faster more compressed way than ever was seen in human civilization and these two schools have been extremely important in the development of that and this does raise interesting questions about um, whether you are now victims of your own success <laughs> because well, we'll take, two, we'll take up two topics. Let's start with the entire world wants to go to school here because you're inventing the future. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? You know, uh, <laughs> we of course see it as a sign of, uh, of the success of our universities and uh, the extraordinary vitality of this region. Uh, uh, but we do turn away a lot of students. Uh, Stanford has the highest uh, selectivity rate in the, in the private sector. We have the highest selectivity rate among public universities and, uh, and, and the reasons I think uh, are, are clear to see. We of course also have lots of pressures that come from uh, people in California feeling that access for California students has, has gotten more and more difficult not just to Berkeley but to the University of California system as a whole. Uh, and um, and, and this, this is troubling because you don't like turning people away but you also know that it's a, a sign of success. Uh, we're not going back to uh, the time when anybody who got a B average in, uh, in a public high school in California could just walk into to Berkeley. You can't, can't keep the system going that way. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but I think, uh, you know, the, the truth is that uh, we, even from the beginning, uh, and I think Stanford was the same, uh, we, we thought we, the institutions worked to bring together some of the best uh, elements of different traditions that had been established across the country. It is true that both Berkeley and Stanford were established to provide a more practical education for a more uh, uh, differentiated group of the people uh, than was uh, seen as possible through the private institutions that existed at the time, most of them on the East Coast. It's also true that that then became the direct link for the development of the research university. <coughs> So the great research universities uh, in the late 19th, early 20th centuries as they emerged were not Yale and Princeton, by no means. They were uh, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, Chicago, Hopkins, the first research university formed by a former president of the University of California, and then increasingly uh, Berkeley and Stanford. They were among the top eight or ten research institutions. And of course, both of our institutions uh, took advantage of the, uh, of, the, of the time after World War II to take to command an increasingly lion's share of uh, federal money that was put for fundamental research. And the system that we have of fundamental research in this country, of course, is not to give money to institutions, but to give money to scientists. Uh, and so we attracted, in part because it was a nice place to live, uh, in part mm -hmm. because I think our predecessors were extremely prescient and uh, very entrepreneurial, some of the very best people across a great many fields who have routinely 
uh, been able to secure far more than the uh, average uh, in terms of federal grants to support research in every area from political analysis to, uh, uh, to, to high, high energy physics. Uh, and indeed, you know, we, uh, we, we have just continued to be a kind of, uh, not just magnet, but a, a kind of uh, a beacon for, uh, for how a great uh, research university can power not just the university itself, but the region, which of course then reinforces and further strengthens our institutions. Uh, are we adequate? Uh, do we have enough spaces in our, uh, in our classrooms to add more? Uh, I've just been told we're supposed to take a lot more students next year at, uh, at Berkeley. So we're working on that. <laughs> you know, Quentin, I, I'd say w we do have a problem, but it's a societal problem. It's what I sometimes call the US News and World Report problem, right? You, you list out, you create this artificial waiting system. Why? parents and young people going to college let U.S. News and World Report tell them what are the most important parameters. I know the people who do use. those lists. It's yeah. such a trip through the sausage factory. Well, it is a trip through the sausage factory, yeah. and it's the fact that that's their highest selling uh, exactly. publication every yeah. year. Yeah. So there, there are certain It has nothing that to do with revenue top. or money they make on it, oh. of course. Uh, <laughs> but it's be created wrong. this craziness in American society where families think, okay, I'm going to apply to something that's number five and number six and number seven, and they think they're making a smart choice. I am shocked when I, I ask families, they know, well, my kid is applying and the schools are numbered this on the US News and World Report. I said, and tell me, what is the average financial aid package that that school gives? Tell me what their average graduation rate is. They have no idea. And so the most important things, which are affordability and graduation, which is what we really care about in the end, um, are being overlooked. We need to get back to American families. We need to get the message out. There are lots of great American universities and colleges, and there is a good one for every single young person in this country. Let me just tell you a little something. I won't say which of your two universities this guy worked for, but I recently saw an admissions counselor, reader, for one of your schools, and he said, I've got less than five minutes for every one of these essays, yeah. and I've got a stack I can't even see over, and I just have to push half of them off the desk before I even start to take it seriously. So. That you know, work you did with pe diseased people in Africa, I've read that one. You know, that uh, 4.5 average you've got, I've seen that one. That stirring story, I've seen all those. And it's a very harsh but accurate depiction of what admissions is now. When, you when, when about you're taking that? one in 20, yeah. you, you have to quickly get down How did to we a get to such a preposterous number. situation? I think it's driven by a few things. Um, first of all, the, there are some really great universities in the U.S., and they offer an extraordinary educational opportunity, and they offer it at the undergraduate level, as well as the opportunity to get involved in research and other things. I think it's partly driven by financial aid and accessibility, and that's a key issue, right, the financial aid opportunities. If you go to a great public institution, you're getting, you're getting help from the state to make it affordable. If you go to a small number of need-blind private institutions, but that's not a large number in the country, you're getting help with that. So that kind of drives families even, even harder. I mean, all these things get added up, but I think there's distortion created by the system. So too many students are applying to, to schools where there are lots of other sc good schools they could apply for. But you know, may I just add here, I think uh, the plight uh, of our public universities is, is, is particularly significant here. 75% of the students who go on for, uh, uh, for, for college go to public institutions. Mm -hmm. And uh, increasingly, the, uh, the kind of across the board state disinvestment that's taken place in North Carolina, Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, uh, uh, Texas, you name it, uh, and California. Uh, has led uh, public universities to be uh, increasingly stressed uh, when it comes to uh, maintaining their research profile. And they, of course, have been uh, great engines of, of, of research in, in many different fields. Uh, but it's put even stress in terms of what their capacity is to, uh, to, to, to 
provide the kind of student experiences that, that, that students want and need. Increasingly uh, so, in fact, when they come from very diverse backgrounds, they need more student support. We have more students than ever who, who, who need help with everything from mental health to uh, you know, special needs. And it's, it's, it's part of the success of the higher educational sector that we're much more inclusive than we've ever been before. But, uh, but at the same time, I really have to say, the, the, the pressures on, on, the, on the publics are huge. Uh, and when you look at the numbers, even between our two institutions, we have 27,000 undergraduates. We have more Pell Grant students at Berkeley, that is to say students who come from families making less than $45,000, $50,000, than you have undergraduate Total students. students yeah. So the question of scale is huge. And when it comes to scale, nothing re will replace the great public universities that have brought students into uh, 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 colleges that provide terrific undergraduate educational experiences and exposure to some of the, the cutting edge research uh, that's been done and is being done in those universities. So that's where I worry. I mean, yeah. in a way, uh, you know, the great privates uh, are going to continue to be strong. And they're going to continue to provide wonderful experiences to the undergraduates who are fortunate enough to get in. Uh, but we have, I think, a growing crisis. And uh, although there are lots of other great places to go to college, as you said, there actually are very few colleges that are, that are actually fully need blind, uh, Correct. full need. Uh, when, you t when you tote them up, the number really very turns small. out to be small. Uh, at, at, at Berkeley, increasingly, just to uh, amend your statement, John, we use uh, the tuition dollars that come in from students to return to uh, students for financial aid. We actually don't get money from the state uh, that's different from right. the Pell Grant right. program right. Uh, for financial aid. In fact, we only get, of our budget, of our total budget, only 12% comes in from the state. So in many respects, we're operating as a private institution. Yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we're deeply committed to access and affordability. And as such, you have to make sure that even when you raise tuition up to $13,000, <laughs> You hang a few more things up there, trust me, it adds up. But even so, it's a, yeah. there's a little delta here. Oh, yeah. Uh, between, uh, and I'll just talk about no Columbia, not, not Stanford. But even, even there, you, you, you need to make sure that the students who uh, have needs uh, have their financial aid yeah. needs met. Now, I suspect part of what's going on in this rush to head to these most selective places is that in the back of people's heads, there is a sense that as much as technology has changed the world and as compressed and as fast as it's happened, it's going to be even more so. And it's going to be a very, very disruptive world. IT is now going to affect everything from human genetics to how you operate a taxi cab company, right? It just shot through. And there's going to be big winners and big losers. So there's a lot of pressure to be among schools and make human networks that have winners. I think that's true, but I think, some, I think what will happen um, will be that information technology becomes a tool used by many disciplines. Yeah. So initially, a lot of the big data analysis uh, component comes out of computer science or statistics. But now, as you see it emerge, what's going to happen is the social science disciplines are going to pick this up. They're going to hire people who are data social scientists who are doing the kind of work. Uh, we just hired a guy who came uh, to us from Berkeley, Raj Chetty, who's done this incredible work that appeared in the New York Times, looking at large-scale databases and understanding what factors influence a young person in terms of having a successful life and moving up the economic scale. Uh, what kind of schools they go to, what kind of neighborhoods they live in, uh, what kind of uh, family structure they have, what kind of social things they're involved in. Um, that kind of analysis is now becoming mainstream by people in economics and political science and, and other social science disciplines. No, no argument on my side. Where I was going was people are worried about how many jobs and how much economic stability there's going to be for 80% of the planet's population? Sure. Is that a good number? You know, sure. something like that. Students are certainly more worried about jobs and careers than they were in an earlier time. And yep. it's coming for you folks, too, in the form of online courses, which may not affect the most elite universities, but is going to completely shiver a lot of tertiary education. Well, I think we're going to have to figure out how do we deploy that technology 
to in a way that is effective for young people, right? It's not a magic wand. You pass online over it and all of a sudden great things happen, right? We know, we, we know how to improve productivity if we wanted to. Just make all classes 200 students and above and make them all large lectures. We could get productivity that way. That's sort of what happens with the MOOC, right? You've got maybe hundreds to thousands of students, uh, not much interaction as there would not be in a large lecture hall with 200 or 300 or 400 students. The real question is how to deliver an effective education in a way that's more efficient going forward. We're all going to have to deal with that issue. Yeah, you know, the questions that have been raised, of course, uh, by many in the public and uh, in my case uh, on a routine basis by the governor of our state around the rising cost structure of higher education are real questions. I mean, these are not uh, 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 just distractions that I think uh, uh, we ignore. We, we're with, we both of us are thinking about how do you make a university more efficient at the same time that you acknowledge the role of human capital, the fact that we have some of the brightest minds in the world that we collect together to whom we wish, wish to give uh, a regular sustained access for our students. And what, of course, we learn as we've been rolling out MOOCs and thinking about online and using online technology to supplement the kinds of other pedagogical activities we mount on campuses is that, uh, is that students need to learn how to learn. Uh, and they have to learn, in particular, how to learn online. And uh, oftentimes, uh, the, the, the notion that you can just go out and uh, sweep away uh, these outmoded, uh, you know, Fordist uh, production lines of uh, seminars and lecture halls in, in the university uh, in favor of the new technology is, you know, just going to solve everything. And of course, we know that's not true. We know that students more than ever uh, desire the residential experience, even when they all crowd into our libraries at, at night, sit next to each other with their laptops or handheld devices, accessing the library. Uh, materials online, but next to each other, asking each other questions, working with each other face-to-face -face, as well as mediated through Facebook and other social media. And what the university does in a way is, uh, is become even more attractive than it's ever been before, in the same sense that cities are more attractive than they've ever, ever been before. Hmm. Now, that doesn't mean hmm. that we aren't going to be able to feed into the fundamental fabric of our educational uh, uh, mission the use of technology. We're developing it. We're using it to indeed help us learn better how students, students learn. Uh, we are flipping uh, uh, classrooms. Last night I had a dinner with the, with the, with the advisory board for the information school at, at Berkeley and I was learning about the new master's program, a master's of Inform information and data science, which is a completely online course. But all the students who can will come to campus for a week or two. They want to meet each other. Yeah. They want to meet the professors. They want to see what the campus is. Uh, and at that level, of course, these are students who are ready to learn online, and even they want to have some relationship to the physical campus. Yeah. But the, the, the fact is that uh, I think the, the, the notion that we're going to disrupt the university entirely, certainly universities like ours, is wrong, even as the notion that we're Luddites and we're just going to resist for reasons having to do with the uh, tenured professoriate or our own commitment to a particular kind of brand, uh, the oncoming rush of technological innovation, equally wrong. I think there's another factor here which is uh, beginning to emerge that people haven't really paid much attention to. And that is, if you look at the completion rates for people to doing online courses, it turns out professionals who are post-college, yep. who are really adding skills, do just fine. Yep. For them, this is about advancing their professional role. They're already well-educated. They do just fine. You look at what's happened with experiments, for example, in remedial education or at-risk kids. This is not an effective way for them to learn. They need personal interaction. They need motivation. They need somebody who will help them when they're struggling with it. Now, our technology will get better over time. It'll get more adaptive. It'll get more supportive. But I think to think that you're going to replace a teacher, particularly for a child who might be struggling in school, whether it's in K-12 or a student who's coming to college, with just a computer, and they're going to be just as successful, I think is naive. You make an interesting point. Mm -hmm. I mean, at present, the most successful cases are about learning the next thing. You're already established, and you need to learn the next thing. And that is a model very much in accord with where the economy is going, right. where there is you know, a degree is a fine signifier. But I don't know a single student who thinks their education ends when they get their diploma anymore. And so you need to be 
inside that kind of mm -hmm. flywheel, if you will, to, to develop it. Um, another aspect of, I know it's not a business, but the, <laughs> the, the industry you're, you're running is uh, the role of TAs, undergraduate assistants, and star professors. Is this a healthy system where we have so many TAs picking up so much of the work and, and certain star professors attracting attention and getting wattage, but more involved with their startup or their lecture tours than with touching students? You know, I think there are always examples that feed that kind of uh, image of the university as uh, made up of, of, of these different populations that occupy totally separate uh, relationship, uh, positions vis-a-vis -vis the actual delivery of education. Uh, but the truth is that it, it doesn't quite work like that. I mean, for example, when Randy Shackman got a Nobel Prize uh, at Berkeley two, uh, two falls ago, he had to cut short uh, his press conference because he was going off to teach his freshman seminar. That's great. And it turns out he's not, he's not unique. Uh, uh, and, uh, and our star faculty uh, are deeply committed to teaching. They work with their graduate students. The graduate students are fundamental to their research. Fundamental to the uh, research uh, and uh, apprenticeship of graduate students is also, of course, learning how to teach, which is what they do, and they are substantially working as apprentices when they're uh, running sections and complementing, supplementing the, the lectures or large courses that uh, are being taught by uh, perhaps the more, the more senior professors. Uh, and the truth is we hire a lot of adjuncts uh, who are not the kinds of adjuncts that you think about when you read the, the, the critiques of, of the university today. We hire people from the Silicon Valley to come and teach at the iSchool because they have expertise and they actually enjoy interacting with students. And a large number of the adjuncts that we hire are in fact professionals who do this because, not for the money, they do it because it gives them that kind of access to really uh, interesting students and also to, of course, colleagues who are working across spaces that, uh, where innovation is taking place all the time. So, you know, it's, imp it's important for us, uh, I think, to be able to counter some of the kinds of things that go on. It's not to say that there aren't universities where uh, star professors don't teach, uh, graduate students are uh, dragged out to, uh, to do the, 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 the greatest part of the burden of teaching, uh, and adjuncts are, uh, are really uh, ground down and, and exploited. But, uh, but I think the, the, the way in which we've fashioned a kind of uh, economy of, uh, of, of, of teaching, uh, learning, uh, and research uh, is much more connected than that image would suggest. Yeah, I, I agree with everything Nick said. I mean, I've taught a freshman seminar. Most of our Nobel Prize winners have taught one. I think an interesting lesson is to see what we do in teaching the most popular course at the university, which is CS 106, the introductory programming course. 90% uh, of the students at Stanford now uh, take this or 105, the uh, other introductory course, uh, which means, by the way, that most of the English majors take it as well, Quentin. Right. Um, and there, we use a model. So we're servicing about 1,500 students a year in that course, normally about 1,000 in the, in the fall quarter. Um, so that does get taught in a large lecture format by one of the university's very best lecturers who gets rave reviews every time. And there we do use it, an interesting model. We use undergraduates as, as assistants in the course. They've already taken a course in preparation for doing this, and they teach in very small groups six to eight students per undergraduate. And the undergraduate really works closely with the students to really prevent them from getting bogged down in the details and getting stuck on some topic. And one of the things about a computer science course is you fail to understand some basic concept, like what assignment means, or what recursion is, or what iteration is. You get lost for the rest of the course because you've missed the concept in week three, you're done. You will not recover. And we have found that other undergraduates who've done very well in the course are the best ones for working in these small groups to helping students succeed. So it's a win-win. They get the joy and the experience of helping somebody else learn, and our undergraduates complete the course. And essentially, we have, from all different parts of the university, people come in and take this course and are successful doing it. They go home, see their parents, bring home a piece of software they've written, 
and their parents are really blown away by what they've been able to do. And then they feel good about paying their tuition bill. <laughs> Which is not trivial. <laughs> uh, we'll proceed to questions in just a moment, and I'll finish my part with a bit of a lightning round. I want you to each say to the other, one public, one private, what is the opportunity you see in the other's school? Which is the nice way of saying, what would you do if you were running the other guy's school? <laughs> John, you're going to have to... I close football, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Really? I'd we're we're both quarterbacking next week, by I the way. I would fix his governance yeah. problem for him because I think, I think the governance of our public institutions, not just in California, but throughout the entire United States, is broken. Not only has the amount of money gone down, but the micromanagement, which is absolutely ridiculous to these great institutions, when it's only 12% of the budget, is out of control. So I would fix his governance problem for him because I think they've done a remarkable job under a enormous burden. <laughs> you know, I have a job for you next year, John. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to love it there. Yeah. No, it is interesting that, uh, I'll get to your question, but it is interesting that the, the, the less money the state has given us, the more they've yeah. actually been micromanaging yeah. and regulating yeah. us. It's crazy. Uh, and, uh, you know, we established a kind of constitutional autonomy way back when, uh, in the late 19th century, that stood us in, stu in such good stead and really was the reason that, uh, that Berkeley became such a great institution. And the, two, the other, and it was modeled on Michigan, that was another great public institution. And increasingly, that seems at risk. Uh, now, of course, at Berkeley, we have a lot of envy for, uh, for your governance, uh, and certainly a lot of envy for your endowment. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it's not about the money, Nick. <laughs> it's not about the money. Uh. So let me keep saying that. Uh, but I think, you know, one of the, so we're, you know, we're, we have 27,000 undergraduates, 10,000 graduate students. We're being pressured by the state to take more students. Uh, it turns out it costs us more than in-state tuition to educate these students by a significant delta. Uh, and so maybe going back, reverting to uh, your early question, um, you know, about selectivity, uh, I might, I might uh, uh, ask whether or not there would be an opportunity for, for Stanford to expand some of the educational opportunities it affords to the, to the public. I don't know what that would entail, whether it would be opening up a you know, a, a, a larger undergraduate um, uh, uh, college in some sense, or using some of that beautiful space you have to, uh, to, 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 to build some more buildings that uh, could accommodate greater numbers. I know that it's From a your really mouth fine... To the, to the county of Santa Clara. Well, <laughs> you have Santa Clara and we have Panorama Hill. Yeah, but, you do. Uh, you do. Uh, you do. We can't even have more than six football games a year. I mean, of course, that's all there are, but uh, we can't have anything <laughs> else in a stadium uh, because of our neighbors. But, uh, but I wonder whether or not uh, the kind of focus on your university uh, and obviously the kind of job you're doing in terms of powering the, the, the valley and, uh, and also becoming you know, mm. increasingly ranked as the top the top place to, to go as an undergraduate, uh, aside from Berkeley, of course, um, wouldn't mean the possibility for some significant expansion. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, we are going to expand. We just have to do it slowly because the cost, the average subsidy we're spending on a student is now, average over everybody, is $20,000, more wow. than $20,000. So, uh, and that's largely because the average for a student on financial aid is about $40,000. Yeah. So that's the, big, that's the big driver, and I don't think we want to change that. I think access is critically important, right? Mm -hmm. But I do think that you know, one of the issues that gets lost when you're talking about uh, the contrast between public and private institutions uh, is that in the research we do, and this is focused, of course, on research, but even in the education we offer in our commitment to access and affordability, uh, you know, it's really impressive that at Stanford, if a student comes from a family making less than $125,000, they don't pay tuition. I mean, this is an extraordinary use of the endowment uh, that's been focused on financial aid for, uh, for, for undergraduates. Uh, I think um, it is important to, to, to recognize the extent to which we are you know, joined at the hip. We are both out there trying, through our research, to make the world a better place. We're both out there trying to create the opportunities for students who might never have dreamed mm. of the possibility of going to college, who certainly come from families uh, who have never uh, been to college. 
uh, to give them uh, the kind of opportunity that our, that our country depends upon to make the ideal of meritocracy into more of a reality for more of our students. Uh, it's a huge challenge. I mean, this is where, you know, I'm very proud to be uh, uh, at Berkeley, where we do give such opportunity to so many students, but we can't do it alone. And uh, in a way, uh, we, we, we both uh, need to partner more to show uh, that we are committed to the same kinds of values, mm -hmm. which are values that are ultimately, I think, going to be in, and in a world of growing inequality, of growing anxiety <laughs> around, around jobs, employment, technology, and the like, uh, increasingly reliant on the university. And we all have to figure out ways to better fund uh, both public uh, and, uh, and, and private universities so that we can continue to fulfill our mission. Very good. I believe, I trust we have a healthy inventory of questions from the audience. And there are people in the back with microphones. Raise your hand and they will reach you. I have a question about research going back to the beginning of the conversation. You're both feeling very stressed in your investment possibilities, where you can put your resources. How do you balance applied versus pure research when you look at where you're going to put your resources? You know, I, I think we don't see it as a um, bimodal distribution. We see a, a, a spectrum, a continuity between applied and, and basic research. I mean, even I, I think most of us would say we don't even do something that's really applied research in the sense of its development. It, it merges on development. We do what I would often think of as strategic research. There's an opportunity. That opportunity that a faculty member sees is often based on some fundamental basic discovery. So there's an opportunity to change, for example, uh, a, great, uh, a great result is this recent one that Steve Quake did developing a blood test for Down syndrome. So you no, need, no longer need to do amniocentesis. Incredible innovation, saves money, saves lives, helps uh, young people deal with a very difficult situation. Um, that, though, was based on a very basic research finding that there are proteins, if you have a Down syndrome mutation, there are proteins in the blood that are in the mother's bloodstream. That's a very basic research insight that then got turned to it. So I don't think we see it as a, as a one versus the other. We see it as a, as a continuum across that spectrum. Yeah, and to uh, reiterate what John said, I mean, the truth is that uh, uh, a great deal of, uh, 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 of the things that we think of as applications of science come out of what we sometimes call curiosity-driven research. Uh, I mentioned Randy Schechtman before for the Nobel Prize he got, uh, which had to do with uh, cytosis in cells and ultimately uh, the development of insulin for uh, treating diabetes. But he got there from doing basic research. Uh, and we can give example after example of uh, where fundamental research has, has led to extraordinary discoveries. I mean, it's been true in every area, including in the history of the computer. But, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, but, but again, uh, uh, we've been advantaged in this country by a federal uh, structure for funding research that has, uh, that has genuinely valued basic research. Uh, the big challenge we have right now is that federal budgets have been flat for uh, far too long. Uh, needs for uh, research support are, are going up all the time. We're ever more reliant in every area from biomedical to you name it, uh, 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 any field in, in, in technology for the kind of research, uh, physics, climate change, uh, uh, and the like uh, for, for support for research. Uh, and what people don't always recognize is that that support comes from a few agencies in Washington for the most part. 3% uh, of our research budget, by the way, at Berkeley comes from the state of California. It's probably the same at Stanford. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very small amount. Uh, over 50% comes from federal granting agencies. Uh, and the rest comes from either f private foundations and gifts, uh, or, um, well, uh, private foundations or, 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 or private gifts. We are at a time when uh, uh, we're going to, I think, see uh, pretty soon a real crisis around uh, funding uh, research, both basic and applied. Uh, we have made partnerships, and we will continue to make partnerships with the private sector when we can engage in research that will simultaneously address our academic interests and needs and fulfill the interests of industry 
uh, in developing uh, uh, research around their own their own their own particular uh, products, interests, uh, uh, market needs, and the like. But uh, but we we do not want to see the, the the space of uh, of support for for fundamental research because mm -hmm. that has in turn been, mm -hmm. I think, one of the reasons why the American research university is the gold standard. And by the way, uh, there are a lot of other countries that know that. And there are places like China that are building universities and they're building them to compete with us. And um, we shouldn't just take for granted that we're the best. We're the best because we have funded our research universities mm -hmm. uh, at the highest levels. That is at risk. Mm -hmm. Next question. Uh, Carl Hewitt, given the decline, current decline and flatness of the federal support, right, and the stinginess of industry, <coughs> sorry, what can we in Silicon Valley do to try to turn around the situation at the federal level to make them realize the fundamental importance of investing in higher education? Well, Carl, I think you hit the nail on the, uh, on the head there. Um, rather than have the universities go to Washington and plead their case with the mm -hmm. federal government, it is much more important to have the high-tech industry, to have the pharmaceutical industry go to Washington and plead the case for the federal investment in science. That is much more effective. And what we need to do is get that high up on the list of things that uh, corporations are telling their people representing them in Washington. It needs to be right up there. R&D tax credit, investment in the universities. Those need to be the key things that they accentuate. And I think that's where the solution will lie, uh, hopefully, over time. Obviously, we have a complex federal budget issue to solve. We've got to solve the growth of entitlement spending, because if we don't solve entitlement spending as a society, there's going to be no money for national defense, for education, for research, for highways, or for anything else. So we as a people need to figure out how we're going to solve that problem and preserve what's really great, which is we have the best research universities in the world. Yep. Everybody comes here to study them. If we don't continue to invest in them, we won't have the best research universities in the world. You'll be going across the other side of the Pacific to see them. Next question. Hello. Uh, Rosalio Vargas, Dynamic Academy. Uh, how do you see 1920 schools uh, compared to today's schools making good workers on which we need good leaders? 1920 schools? You mean, you mean what was the context of the 1920? Well, I, I see them as the same, yeah. like the schools. And, and there's an 80%, as you said, uh, struggling. And you call it mental disorder, like ADHD and all that. But I believe that everyone has a natural genius. You know, things have changed over the years in a very dramatic way. You know, 50 years ago, if you didn't come from a middle class or better family, if you didn't have go to a good K-12 school, if you didn't have certain opportunities, you didn't go to college. And that was okay, because you could go to high school and you could get a, a, a decent job and earn a middle class income. The problem is lots of those jobs have disappeared in the U.S. And a college education is increasingly important to get a job that will support the standard of living you need in our country. So we now need to embrace a much larger set of students. Uh, it's not that everybody needs to go to college. That's not the right model. But a larger fraction of our population needs to go to college. And we struggle with a very deep problem. People think just because kids get admitted to school, to a college, they're going to graduate. Only 65% of the students who start full-time in a four-year institution complete a degree. And if you look at our community colleges, they struggle even more. We need to worry about that problem because that's where the future of the American workforce is. Yeah, no, the, uh, the, these issues of both uh, access to, to good colleges and then graduation, they're, they're huge. And, uh, uh, we, don't, we don't live in that world. Uh, uh, public universities, as a rule, have a lower graduation rate than private universities, but if you extend the period of time, the great publics actually are right up there. I mean, we have a six-year graduation rate of 92%. I think that's same. pretty 93. much the same as, as, as Stanford. Uh, it turns out, because we have a, such a diverse student body, that uh, a lot of them work, some of them take a semester off, 
uh, family uh, or other issues uh, get in the way, but they come back and they finish and we work very hard to <coughs> make sure they do. Uh, but, you know, uh, if you look even at the uh, uh, much heralded experiments taking place at Arizona State University, it's a place that has a graduation rate of 45 percent. Right. And uh, that's, you know, a significant institution. It's also the largest public university in the country in terms of number. But a lot don't make it, more don't make it through than do. Yeah. And I think if you have access without completion, you've only solved half the problem. Next question. Ah. It helps? Yes. Mr. John, Mr. Nicholas, uh, I appreciate the opportunity and thank you for leading the world. It's very important and great responsibility that you have with the students to drive the world to a better place, like you say. But I would like to hear your plans to how will you help the people to connect with inner itself. Now the technology is connecting in the outside, but what will be you do to connect the inner self of the persons because the whole persons must be taken in consideration to be a better world? Thank you. You know, you know I think we, we completely agree that the task of education is not to, just to teach a set of skills. I mean, even going back to the origins of our universities, uh, with the push towards uh, more practical education. There was also a, a recognition that students coming to college had to have some kind of, well, at the time it was called a moral education, uh, but it was an education about what uh, it means to be human, mm. what it means to, uh, to think about the really big issues that confront us as, as, as human beings, both individually and as members of a society. And, and, and one of the reasons that we uh, insist on this notion that it takes four years to get an undergraduate degree, and indeed with the state of uh, K through 12 education being what it is, that seems ever more uh, important. Uh, but one of the reasons for that is that we actually build into our curriculum for all of our students a sizable commitment to what we call the liberal arts and sciences. Mm -hmm. And those include courses that uh, attempt to expose students to some of the great texts, some of the great issues, some of the great debates that have uh, uh, been part of our, our history over time, uh, and to ask the students to wrestle with them. And we think about that in part as a civic education, how do you make students actually full participants in a democratic society, but we also, whether they're contemplating works of art or reading literature or uh, performing music, uh, understand that this is a time of life when students really need to engage uh, some fundamental issues having to do with what it means to be alive, with what it means to take on uh, uh, the kind of uh, uh, issues that adults will, uh, will then, uh, of course, be um, uh, uh, confronting in all kinds of ways across their lives, and we hope they can draw upon the resources they get in some of those, uh, those early courses. Recently, uh, 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 the governor of California suggested that we should increase the number of three-year degrees at, at Berkeley. Uh, and we do actually have some students who go through in three years, usually uh, because they come in with lots of AP courses. But uh, the worry here is that students who need it most are not going to have that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And we uh, have been told uh, increasingly in our society, this is a luxury. You don't really need to uh, spend all this money, uh, whether it's taxpayer money or student money, and of course it's less and less taxpayer money, uh, to, uh, to engage in these kinds of, uh, 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 this kind of educational folly. I mean, that's how it's often seen. Uh, but I think uh, uh, at Berkeley, and I'm sure at Stanford, at Columbia, uh, we, we, we do believe that uh, there's, there's something uh, really fundamental to the kind of education that we offer that allows students to engage themselves uh, and to use some of the great works of art, and some of the great debates about, about, about politics, and even some of the great questions in our economy, uh, and even the issues that are being raised by technology. What does it mean to be human in a world in which increasingly uh, uh, the things that we thought we did exclusively turn out to be done just fine by technology? Well, uh, we, we, we build that into the curriculum, and it turns out uh, when students come back for uh, their 25th or their 50th reunion, <laughs> they're often talking about those courses. Mm. They're also they're, they're, they're saying, you know, when I read, uh, when I read these, uh, the, these formative texts, uh, they, they, they stayed with me. Yeah. 
I agree. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> hey, um, uh, Professor Dirks, thanks for the shout out at Cloudera. Uh, <laughs> as we are co-founded by both Berkeley and Stanford alumni, it's great to see uh, both of you share the stage. So um, a question for uh, Professor Dirks, the histor historian, and Professor Hennessy, the technologist. So um, <laughs> what can we do uh, in the Silicon Valley uh, to help to ensure the strength of both of your technology programs and humanity and social science programs to help ensure that they both thrive and both con continue to contribute to the greatness of Berkeley and Stanford? You know, we are uh, always trying to make connections with our alumni in particular. Uh, the wealth of a university like, uh, like Berkeley's is, uh, is not measured in its endowment and it's certainly not measured in its state allocation. Uh, it is often expressed, however, uh, in, in, in the lives and in the uh, commitments of, uh, of, of a vast circle of alums. We have 450,000 alums. Uh, very few of them stay connected. Uh, this is actually something the public universities are working to change uh, and to do a much better job of in ways that uh, reflect what many of the top private universities have done much more effectively. But we want you to stay connected. And that can mean any number of things. Uh, it can mean giving us advice when we're putting together a new, say, master's course in, uh, in, in data science for the information school. It may mean uh, providing internships for our undergraduate students to give them a sense of what life in, uh, in your company is like and to show them that uh, you're dealing with you know, all kinds of issues every day and they're actually rather more complex than just the textbook or the classroom would suggest. It might mean uh, 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 providing uh, resources for, uh, uh, for students uh, from, from underprivileged backgrounds to have these educational opportunities. It could, could meet any number of things, mm -hmm. but most of all, it comes from staying connected. I think the important thing that we're both of us saying this morning is that we have, we have the very best research universities in the world. And actually, Northern California has two of the very best research universities uh, anywhere, too. I mean, this is part of the reason that this region is so successful. But don't take us for granted. Don't forget <laughs> us. Stay in touch with us. <laughs> and remember that ultimately, our success will depend upon your support. You know, I think um, looking at the, the, how American universities have survived, I think we look at government funding, we look at pr great privates and great publics together, very unusual in the rest of the world. It's almost <clears throat> divided into publics versus privates and very few countries have both strength in both. But the other piece of that is philanthropy. That's an American tradition. It is not a tradition in Europe. It is not a tradition in most of Asia, although it's emerging now in parts of Asia. And it has strengthened our universities. I remind our incoming undergraduates that their education, they're there, and the quality of their experience is partly due to a gift that somebody else that had that great experience made to the university right. that enables them to have that kind of education. From its origin. From its origin. From the origin with the Stanfords in our case, right? It was their gift to the university, as they say, to the future students of California. And that is a great tradition and one that I think we have to, we have to keep up. Okay, time for three more questions. So I'm from SAP, uh, where I'm leading a network of 2,400 universities around the world. And when we started doing that, it was mainly to um, build a number of great talent out there to recruit into the big SAP ecosystem. Many companies of the world are running SAP. But what we see right now, because of digital transformation, and that's what I would like you guys to elaborate a little bit on, because we talk a lot about the students. It's very, very key, because it's the mind of the students who will shape the future. But we, as you said, we are seeing that the world of the students are, are trying to come to Silicon Valley, are trying to apply for your great schools, but we also see that the company of the world are coming to Silicon Valley. So my question is, do you see that you will invest more, do more, much more than you do today? I know you do a lot, but much more engaging with the industry of the world, you can call it kind of like more kind of, yes, research, but more co-innovation. I know at Stanford you have this great network with Larry Leifer, uh, uh, where you are having, a, I call it the innovation build to universities around the world, where you work with the Audi, the Deutsche Bank, the great companies. Is that something we would see that would expand 
we hope so from, from SAP because we see right now that the mind of young people is helping SAP's compass to build the future solution. That's my first question. Are you going to expand that? Second question is, what is your role? How do you see? I know you are talking a lot about the young people, all the great young people, which is important. But what do you, what do you see your role is, or will you have a role in educating um, more the, you know, the, my, my age, I kind of like the people who did go to school and are coming back to school. Are you going to expand education program for executive education or professional education in general? Because the whole world are going through this digital transformation where everybody kind of need kind of to go back and rethink that whole thing. So that was my two questions. Yeah, okay. Yeah? Well, maybe I'll take one and sure. give you two. Whichever one you prefer. The answer is yes, yes, <laughs> yes, <think>. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to give that answer. But oh, just yes to, but, but to, the, uh, uh, to, to question one, I just wanted to give uh, uh, one example of something we're doing precisely along those lines, which is to say where I mentioned the Richmond Bay uh, uh, campus that we have at, at Berkeley, where we launched the first self-driving car. Uh, but it's now uh, uh, being planned to be uh, what we call the Berkeley Global Campus. And we're inviting in both international universities, but also uh, industrial partners to create a new kind of space, which will be a much more porous space. It'll be a global space. Uh, it'll be a space where, uh, where we work together uh, uh, around global challenges, whether climate change or uh, uh, data issues or cybersecurity or precision medicine, any number of things. Uh, but we're, th we're seeing this as a space in which precisely uh, co-innovation will take place uh, with researchers from around the world, not just from universities, but from uh, industrial partners, some hopefully perhaps here at home and others in, in companies that have a, a, a foothold uh, around the world. Uh, we think it has to be done uh, in a multilateral way. It can't be done by a single university. We think it has to be done globally. And we think we ha it has to be done across uh, the, the usual sectors of the university and, uh, and, and, and the private sector. So, uh, so that's an example where we're actually providing a kind of laboratory to see uh, whether we can uh, increase dramatically uh, those, kinds of, those kinds of partnerships. So when I arrived in Stanford in 1977, maybe you weren't quite born yet, but if you were, you were a young woman uh, <laughs> at that point. Uh, I taught, the very first I course I taught was taught online. And it was taught online with an old closed circuit TV system that we used in those days. Uh, today, we teach those courses all the time. They're online now, so they're not taught with this old closed circuit TV. We have tens of thousands of students in the Valley. Uh, increasingly, we're doing short courses in the business school as well because there's demand for something other than the traditional MBA, right? It's executive education. People in the Valley don't have two years to take off from work to go get a traditional MBA. So we've had to think about how do we offer them an opportunity that helps them develop leadership skills and management skills or technical skills. And I think you're just going to see that grow. The lifelong education model is the future, and universities should be deeply invested in that future. Next question. Uh, there is a substantial body of employer comments and a substantial body of academic research, including brand names institutions such as yours, indicating that undergraduate students are not learning how to think critically. Uh, how do you refer to, uh, how do you react to these uh, statements? Well, th there is indeed academic research that, uh, uh, that suggests that we have an, a growing a growing crisis. Uh, the most famous work that was written to that effect uh, by two sociologists academically adrift uh, used the CLA to make some rather uh, uh, damning comments about uh, the critical thinking capacities of students who've gone through four-year educational uh, degrees. Not at Berkeley or Stanford, uh, by the way. Uh, but in a way that both, uh, I think, uh, uh, takes us back to what John uh, talked about is perhaps uh, an even greater crisis, which is the state of our K through 12 education. Uh, as well as I think, and in this case it, uh, it reverts to some of the things I was talking about more generally, to some of the challenges of, the, of, the, of, of tier two and three public institutions where most of our, uh, our kids go to, go to college. Uh, and, uh, and, and when you have a, a, a university where you simply don't have the resources to 
engage students as individuals, to provide them the support they need, to challenge them in ways that uh, is very labor intensive, right? I mean, it means you have to do the iterative uh, pedagogical teaching that, that requires more than simply te you know, checking off a box if somebody hands in a, uh, an exercise or whatever it is in a, in, a, in, a, in a class that's got 400, 500 students. It's very hard to, <coughs> to, to make real educational progress there. Uh, and so uh, I, we are concerned about, uh, about those kinds of studies. Uh, I do believe that one of the things that we do in, uh, in the great institutions, and I think we're unparalleled in that, in that regard, is we take students from a lot of different backgrounds who in the first year might think, oh my goodness, uh, I can't compete here, and get them to the point uh, after four years where they're as good and sometimes better because they're hungrier than any of the other students. And they go out and they do extraordinary things. And we do, as we've been trying to say, train them to continue to learn to learn how to shift. We, uh, you said, John, we're not training them for one job. In, in fact, at the moment, students on average will have six different jobs, and we think right. in the future it's going to even be an expon uh, 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 exponentially more than that. So we, uh, we think we're doing a, a good job, but it takes resources to do that. And the current you know, sort of uh, refrain that we get in, you know, from, from Sacramento and, 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 and Washington and other places, of course, as well, is just that, you know, just be efficient, just churn students through, just get them, uh, get them in and get them out. Uh, and we have an obligation, as, as you rightly point out, to do far more than that, and to do far more than that for a much broader spectrum of our, of our, of our society. Oh, yeah, I think if you take one example, learning to write well, there is no way you can teach with a lecturer standing up there and 200 or 300 or even 100 students in a class and teach people to be good writers. It requires somebody sitting down individually, looking at a piece they've written, taking it apart, saying, why did you write this sentence this way? Why didn't you structure it this way? Why didn't you do this? That kind of intensive learning experience, which does, I think, produce real learning outcomes that are observable, is not something you can do in a large lecture format. It's going to require a hands-on approach to teaching. And we need to keep that in mind if we want to produce people who are really capable. Last question. A Lenchist at Computer History Museum. Returning to the theme of whether undergraduate education is too narrowly focused on tech, should, should engineers know who Chaucer and Botticelli are? Uh, I was at the opening of the new Yale campus at Singapore last month, and they're trying a new retrograde exper uh, experiment of requiring for the first two years all undergraduates to take a fixed set of courses, no electives. They study things they didn't think they needed to know. Is that a good idea? And if you had a magic wand, would you do that at your institutions? <laughs> you know, so we have, a, we have a broad set of liberal arts requirements. Students have to take courses ranging in things from confronting diversity and how to live and be, and be successful in the diverse world in which we live here, just in the state of California. They have to take courses in ethical reasoning. They've got to take a course in creativity and the arts. So we've got a firm foundation of courses like that. I'd say our experience in creating a fixed, predetermined curricula with no electives is that students do not find it as engaging um, as they would when they get a choice to choose. Not to blow up the entire framework and not take courses in critical areas, but to choose, I want to take this course in this area or this course in this area. In some sense, take history, Nick's field. I, I don't care what period of history they decide to study. What I want them is to delve deeply into history to read some original sources, to look at why people are making decisions, to understand how things go, the interplay between society and leadership and history and how it works out. That's what I want them to know. Whether they do it about ancient Greece and Rome or they do it about the United States or they do it about Europe, I don't, that's probably not the important thing. And they will be more interested if they get to choose which time and period in history they study. You know, there's been a, a continuous debate uh, between those who've advocated for electives and those who've advocated for a fixed curriculum. Charles Eliot at Harvard was the, uh, really the, the first major university leader to say, uh, let's go with electives. Students should choose. Uh, and uh, Nicholas Murray Butler and uh, Robert Maynard Hutchins at, uh, at Columbia in Chicago 
uh, respectively, were ones who believed that there had to be a common core curriculum. I taught at Columbia. I taught in the core curriculum. It was wonderful. Yeah. It was That's wonderful. Uh, what was particularly wonderful about it was that every student in the freshman or sophomore class was taking some courses and reading some texts at the same time together so that when they would come from a section of 22 fellow students and then go for lunch, they would sit down and all of them uh, were reading uh, Adam Smith or uh, Edmund Burke at the same time and they could uh, get involved in a debate and they had something to talk about other than football. Well, at Columbia they didn't talk about football. <laughs> the reason for that. Not without lots of libations first. Anyway. Or, or movies or whatever. But, uh, but we don't have magic wands. I, I, I chuckled because, you know, the magic wand idea does occur to us usually at uh -huh. two in the morning, but we wake up and we are soberer then. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and what we do try to do, I think, through our existing uh, curricular capacity uh, is to ensure that students do have a kind of breadth uh, that does expose them to, uh, again, uh, not just a range of disciplines, but to a range of questions that draw from multiple disciplines. One of the things that always worries me about undergraduate education in this country, and it's true everywhere, uh, is that uh, we sometimes, as a professoriate, uh, try to do for undergraduates a small version of what we do for our graduate students, rather than thinking about uh, how uh, mm. students come out of high school That's and really need to have a different kind of exposure to, uh, uh, to a range of, uh, of, of questions as well as, as well as texts and skills across uh, the full spectrum of the, of the curriculum. <laughs> Uh, and so, you know, I've inaugurated at, at Berkeley, certainly, an undergraduate uh, initiative in which we're looking at uh, what we call a Berkeley curriculum and trying to produce mm -hmm. at least a menu, a menu that is, uh, if not a prefix, certainly, uh, you know, a limited menu uh, that can contain some things that uh, faculty and students can come to agree every student should pick from, uh, at least for some of the key things they do during their early years. I always worry when, uh, uh, when students uh, think about majoring too quickly and feel that the major somehow uh, becomes their primary identity as a student. Uh, and this is something that, particularly in a, in a large uh, uh, university like Berkeley, one sort of works against. But uh, the truth of the matter is that uh, you know, our institutions uh, uh, continue, continue to value a liberal arts education. And, we are increasingly in the minority. So one thing I really want to uh, uh, stress as we, as we close this morning is the importance of remembering the liberal arts is not a luxury. It's not a luxury. It may seem that way, uh, but it's no more a luxury uh, than, to go back to the earlier question, than, uh, than, than, than taking time to remember that we're human beings and that we're educating uh, young students not just to have skills, not just to have careers, but to be better human beings. And that is one of the things that keeps us going, even when we get up very early in the morning and have to brave traffic to get down to a breakfast <laughs> like this. Uh, believe me. Not to mention a knowledge <laughs> of your forebears and what they've seen fills you as a human. Sure. Thank Absolutely. Darren. On behalf of our audience. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, that was great. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nick, John, for sharing your passionate perspectives and insights with us. We know you have many demands on your time, and we really appreciate that you chose to spend the morning with us, and Quentin, for leading this discussion so beautifully. Thank you. As a small token of our appreciation, we have for you, for your leisure time, a Churchill Club speaker t-shirt. All right. All right. Please wear that in good health. Great. A recording of this program will be posted on the Churchill Club YouTube channel, hopefully within about 24 hours. So we hope that you will find that to be a useful resource. Most of our other programs are posted there as well. So please, if you enjoyed this program, do tell others about it and allow them to access the conversation as well. Um, you have been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much. See you next time. Thank you.